I was going to go to university. My dad said, what are you good at? And I said, English and history. And he said, because he was working in radio at the time, and he said, why don't you have a look at broadcasting? And once I got into a television studio and saw actors and cameras and all that stuff, I just went, I want to do this. They had a cadetship. You had three months in different departments. And I, I actually suspect the personnel officer, when I interviewed for television, he actually fell asleep in the interview. He was so old that he fell asleep. So, but I got in, and um, but it was a great introduction. John McRae became the head of drama. He said what we needed to do was get a soap opera going to, to basically upskill everybody, actors, directors, writers. The one thing I remember is doing my first block, you know, having the screening with John McCrae and being terribly excited about this camera angle or that camera angle. And all he was interested in talking about was the performances. And it was a huge wake up to me. That's what I've always remembered. Because, you know, that's, especially in that kind of show, that's what's important. I had the idea of doing a story about a band. I was about 25. And suddenly I was producing and directing. And what astonishes me now, there's two things. One is I think it's, I look back and I think it's good. It's a good, it was a good show. And we took on a lot, you know, trying to do music. And we had some musicians in the cast and some actors. Michael has trained himself to be a drummer and in the end could actually do a reasonable job. But then my naivety was <laughs> there was, I auditioned Russell Crowe, who was then known as Russell Rock, and like an idiot, because he, I, you know, I turned him down, you know, we didn't use him because he didn't fit the two characters that we had. So me being an idiot, we said no. And he would have been, I think he would have been fantastic. And it was before he had any career as an actor. Initially it was quite tough because you just have to re-establish yourself. I got offered a gig back here, it was cover story, and I came back and suddenly I felt at home. Suddenly I knew what the cultural values were. I understood exactly what was going on. I felt far more welcome. Australians look like us, but I believe that when you start trying to make drama and stuff about them, the values are quite different. And things like their attitudes to race and, um, you know, I think it's uh, Australian men, I've, I believe, you know, they, I think they're under huge pressure to, to, to be an Aussie bloke. And if you're not, it can get quite tough. And there's equal pressure on Australian women, I think, too. So there was all that stuff that, you know, I think this is... I only realised when I came back how much more comfortable I felt being back here because I understood. I really loved Cover Story. It was intelligent and um, quite hard-hitting and covered interesting issues and covered them in an interesting way. The central cast were terrific. Um, I look back at it now, I'm, you know, I think it's great. In fact, somebody said to me recently that they should rethink doing something like that again. John Gilbert is a, an extremely successful and capable editor. And we started to talk about forming a production company. And as a new product, production company, you've got to kind of look around and go, okay, where can we get in here? And so the idea of two rural idiots who suddenly, who have lived with, who've had their mother to rule their lives all ever since they were born, suddenly having to face the modern world. We just, so we did a short film that was quite successful. And then we thought, well, we might be able to do a TV series out of this. We had a great writing team and a great cast but I think we got a bit lost. I think we got a bit carried away. Because <laughs> one of the things I learned on that show is that comedy, how tough comedy is. And even though the show was very successful in public terms, the reviews were awful. And a lot of people in the industry didn't like it either. And I think it's because we strayed into farce without quite realizing it. And I th one of the things I've learned since then is that with comedy, you've got to be very clear about the type of comedy you're making. Is it farce, is it satire? So it was a great learning lesson, and, and, and as I say, the show did well, but it took a couple of years for my career to recover from this.
I mean, I wasn't the only one involved, and the network did have a strong scene of casting, but there are some faces in there that I'm really proud of that I fought for. It was very much James and Rachel's idea. And you don't control the money because that's controlled by SVP itself. But I had so I, but I had a lot to do with the look of the show, casting the you know, choosing the directors. And I was deeply involved in the casting as well. The, <laughs> the casting was an interesting because the funny thing about it, Rangers then, is it wasn't the big show. Because Madigan's quest was being done, and that was a kind of a bigger deal at SPP at the time. And we were just sort of off to the side a little bit. But there were, like, the network didn't want Robin Melbourne to begin with because they thought she was too well established on Short Victory. Um, and she is so obviously the right person. There were battles about um, Anthony Starr because he had availability problems. And I knew he was the only person who could do it. There were, guy, there were other actors who could do a fine job of one brother or other, but I had to fight a little bit to get him in. There were other people who just walked into their roles. You know, Antonia, she did one audition and we went, fantastic. But there were, I mean, there are funny things like Munter was originally a white guy. But because Tammy's audition was so fantastic, well, they changed it around. So it was interesting. I mean, I think what part of the success of Average Fortune is because it was a great idea. The scripts were very, very clever. And they were funny and dramatic and they had great heart in them as well. You had a fantastic central character whose quest you could all empathise with. You know, a woman trying to save her family. And we got fantastically lucky with the casting. The casting, there wasn't one member of that cast who didn't go on to be fantastic. Mark Beasley was the producer. He was changing the style of the show from the previous series and that was what he'd been asked to do. In some ways it was easy to relate to him because he's a director so he understands the director's concerns. I think Mark's a fantastic director so it was really interesting to hear his perspective. Because one of the problems as a director is you never get to see directors work. It's not dissimilar to having sex. I mean, it was, we, we all know everybody does it, but you don't get to see other people do it that often, which is a good thing. But it is, it is I, I think it's interesting because that's one of the reasons that you, it's interesting talking to other actors and talking to actors and other, direct, um, other technicians is because they'll tell you how other directors work, but you don't. <laughs> Can you believe them? I've done three of them in recent years, being Underbelly and Siege, and um, I've just done a documentary about Nancy Wake. And there was an Underbelly style, you know, that had been set up on the Australian shows. And we basically wanted to keep that going, but also to add us uh, a New Zealand element to it in terms of the way it was lit and the way it was performed. We went for a warmer kind of, probably a slightly glammier look because the underbelly thing was meant to be a bit of a kind of rollicking yarn really because although it was drugs and stuff and there was, you know, really dark stuff going on, it was intended as an entertainment. Whereas Siege, we, what we wanted to do was to depict what happened as closely as we possibly could the police who were actually involved, they were quite often on set on the day and were shot in the real house in the real street. Um, we had fantastic access to things like um, some of Jan's, Jan Molinar's phone conversations. So we had, we were, we worked really hard to be as close to the truth of what happened as possible. I think the first thing is to be very clear about what what your role is on this particular show and what they're trying to do. And if you don't like it, don't do it. You know, I think sometimes directors can go in and try and change a show. And I don't do that. If I don't want to do the show, I don't do it. So it's fit, so it's fitting within the the tone and the feel of the show that's already existing. Yeah, I mean, you can you can want to. I mean, I go and. My attitude now, as I say, you, I temper my approach depending on what the, on the nature of the show. 
So I take a different approach with something like Underbelly or Siege where I was involved really early on and it was a kind of one-off as opposed to when you go in and do something like Almighty Johnson's or nothing truly you're aware. The style and the pattern of the show is set. The show is successful and your job is to do this particular script as well as you can. But I, I think, it, I think not, I, my understanding is from what, from talking to actors, is not enough directors talk to the actors. That you, your way of communicating the material to the audience is principally, in television particularly, through the, through the performances of the actors. That's how you tell the story.